Hi everyone, I'm Barry Mitchell and welcome to Simply Science. It's February and we're going to tell you all about the science of love. Also, some facts you might not know about the heart itself. But first, February is Black History Month and we'd like you to meet the first two African-American women inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. Here's Mike Gilliam with more on their work and their New York City connection. I worked very hard with my team. Doctors Marion Croak and Patricia Bath will soon be inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. Against huge odds and through science, they've persevered and changed our lives. Dr. Croak is a vice president of engineering at Google and holds some 200 patents. She's credited with bringing us voice over the internet while working at Bell Labs. There was a decision made to combine the data and voice networks and they, many different alternatives were looked at for that. And I was a very strong proponent of trying voice over IP to have an internet network, a network that connected uh, people through the internet and then put voice traffic on it. And many of the colleagues that I worked with at the time doubted that we could ever make it work. But Croak, who grew up on Manhattan's Upper West Side and graduated from Princeton and USC, would not be deterred. She and her small team worked tirelessly to put voices over the internet in a reliable way. It took quite a lot of time and effort and failure to do it, but we eventually got it done. And I guess the rest is history. So you and I are talking over voice over IP right now. That technology is the basis for much of our communication, especially during the pandemic. Many times when you're making a wireless call, definitely when you're making a call from your home phone, you're using voice over IP. And in all the communications that are going on now through Zoom and Meet and other technologies um, and other services are using voice over IP. The technology has also been adapted in other ways. American Idol used it to allow viewers to cast their votes in the talent contest. Coast, the first person to make it through tonight is... That led Dr. Croak to another idea, instantly raising money for those in need. I mean, we could do it for something like American Idol. Why couldn't we do it for people who are suffering from some sudden tragedy? Croak says it's an honor to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. I'm happy that there was recognition for the work that had been done. It was, it was hard work at the time, but I'm glad that people have been able to use the technology um, so much, especially during this pandemic. Dr. Croak will go into the Hall of Fame with another New Yorker. Dr. Patricia Bath created and holds the patent on a type of cataract surgery that she invented back in 1986. It's called laser phaco. Laser FACO is a new technique in which laser energy, rather than ultrasound energy, is used to fragment the lens nucleus. Dr. Bath is a CUNY alum, having graduated from Hunter College before going on to Howard University Medical School and Columbia before landing at UCLA. She died in 2019, but she was the first African-American female doctor to receive a medical patent. Her daughter, Dr. Erica Bath. My mother determined the late, she determined the way to use lasers. Lasers really hadn't been applied successfully for cataracts. And so she figured out the, the frequency, um, the temperature, um, the amount of time to really bring that type of technology to cataracts. Dr. Erica Bath is an associate professor at the David Geffen UCLA School of Medicine where she holds a number of leadership positions. She says her mother's invention used a smaller probe that allowed for quicker recovery times because the incision was smaller. 
Patricia Bath also co-founded the American Institute for Blindness. And while interning at Harlem Hospital, she discovered that African Americans were twice as likely to suffer blindness and eight times as likely to develop glaucoma as their white counterparts. What my mom noted was that at Harlem Hospital, at the eye clinic, there were no surgeries being done, which was different at Columbia where they were doing ophthalmic procedures. A woman who accomplished many firsts, she got surgeons from Columbia to come to Harlem Hospital and perform the first eye surgeries there and developed a community ophthalmology system, providing eye care for those who couldn't afford it. I would love for her to be remembered as a you know visionary, innovator, pioneer, trailblazer, humanitarian, in the meantime, Dr. Marion Croak has a message for all thinking of going into science-related fields. So I would encourage young women, people of color, to please join me in pursuing STEM and just working in technology companies. We need you. We definitely need you. I'm Mike Gilliam for Simply Science. Every Valentine's Day, we're bombarded with gooey love songs and romantic comedies. But for all the art that love inspires, what is it that really makes our hearts go pitter-pat? Our own Cupid, Ari Goldberg, has the science behind love. Just turn on any radio or TV around Valentine's Day and it's all you find. People want to know about this crazy little thing called love, the most confusing, wonderful, gut-wrenching, undefinable emotion of the human experience. But as we flip through the stations this month, that hasn't stopped many a lucky or unlucky in love from trying to define it anyway. True love is the greatest thing in the world, except for nice MLT, mutton, lettuce, and tomato sandwich when the mutton is nice and lean. Overrated. Biochemically no different than eating large quantities of chocolate. Is there something to that? Can love be quantified along biological desires like hunger or chemical reactions like that, scientifically? Or to put it more elegantly, what is love? to answer the great bard Hathaway, while we don't understand the whole puzzle of what makes the book of love, from genetic to psychological to cultural influences, we do indeed have some understanding of the neuroscience involved. Many scientists break it down into three rough categories, lust, infatuation, and attachment. And of course, whether you like it or not, you'll hear about all of them across the airwaves all month. Please, baby, let's get it on. When we lust for people, in scientific terms, that's just our evolutionary drive to perpetuate the species. The endocrine system, our body's hormone regulation system, comprises, in part, our pituitary gland and hypothalamus. These stimulate our sex hormones, like testosterone and estrogen, regulating our desires for sexual gratification, and therefore, in a more clinical sense, our innate urge to produce more little baby humans to create the next generation. As far as infatuation goes, this is that feeling in that first honeymoon phase with a partner when you're just crazy about them, can't keep your mind off them. The brain plays a major role here. MRIs have shown that the reward centers of the brain light up when people are shown photos of someone they're deeply attracted to. High levels of dopamine and norepinephrine, some of the brain's major reward and fight or flight chemicals, are released when spending time with loved ones, which can make us excitable, giddy, 
and physically feel our heart race. And conversely, it seems that serotonin, another neurochemical associated with mood regulation and a sense of control, is actually lowered during this phase. There's thought this could influence that early relationship feeling of almost compulsive infatuation, of not being totally in control. God only knows what I'd be without you. Our last phase is calmer, long-term attachment. And as we all know, not every relationship makes it there. Once the body grows some tolerance to the spikes of lust and attraction, and some of the chemical levels normalize, sometimes there's nothing to keep it together. In long-term relationships, however, other neurochemicals come into play, like vasopressin and oxytocin. Oxytocin is sometimes nicknamed the cuddle hormone, and is involved in bonding, regardless of a romantic aspect. For instance, it is released during sex, yes, but also with hugging, childbirth, and breastfeeding, too. Of course, there's a downside to all those happy chemicals, too. These same neurochemicals that can keep us coming back to vices like gambling or drugs can be at play when it comes to things like coming back to a bad relationship, unhealthy emotional dependency. And sexual arousal is associated with a deactivation of parts of the frontal cortex. You know, the decision-making part of the brain. In fact, depending on how you define it, some scientists quite literally classify love's effects on the brain as addictive. Now, of course, there's plenty we don't understand about the science of love. As indeed, there's still plenty we don't understand about the brain. This isn't a guide for how to go about living your romantic life any more than TV or silly little love songs are. But when it comes to how crazy love can make us, we at least maybe have a little more self-awareness now of how sometimes we can truly be blinded by science. For Simply Science, I'm Ari Goldberg. Last month, a 57-year-old Maryland man received a genetically modified pig heart in a first-of-its-kind transplant surgery. But author Bill Shutt says the ancient Egyptians were studying cardiac medicine as far back as 1500 BC. Everybody's got a pumping heart. Everybody's got a pumping heart. Why do we think that the heart is the center of emotion? Yeah, it's from the ancient Egyptians, then to the Greeks, then to the Romans. Meet zoologist Bill Shutt, author of Pump, A Natural History of the Heart. The ancient Egyptians thought a lot about the heart. The heart was alive, it beat, it, it moved. They thought that the heart with its central location and its, the, the fact that it was extremely active made it very, very important. They thought that it was really the seat of, uh, of intellect and the soul and emotions. Uh, they didn't really care too much about the brain. They thought that the, that, that the brain was a radiator that, that wound up cooling the heart. Let's talk about biggest heart, smallest heart. We start with the blue whale. Blue whale, largest heart in the world, probably around 400 pounds. And how much does a blue whale weigh? 90 tons. Relatively speaking, a hummingbird, which is a tiny, tiny bird, yeah. has a big heart. Yeah, a much larger heart than, say, something like a blue whale because of how active it is. So really small animals that have a high metabolic rate uh, that are, for example, flapping their wings 80 times per, per second, uh, they have a lot more need for oxygen and nutrients. So their hearts have to beat a lot faster, and they've got to be a lot bigger. When you see these little tiny pumps that insects have... Wait a minute. Insects have hearts? Absolutely. Listen, if you were a cardiologist, you might not call it a heart. But it's a pump, and it pumps a fluid around the body to carry nutrients, to carry oxygen, to carry carbon dioxide and waste. So it's a heart in my book. You know, in modern times, cardiac catheterization is an easy way to, say, deliver drugs to the heart or install a valve. Back in the 1920s, it was unheard of. The only way you could get into the chest was to cut it open or you could use a hypodermic needle. A resident by the name of Werner Fossmann in Berlin in 1928 decided that he would try out a new technique and he actually catheterized himself. And he decided that he would try to use a urethral catheter and that he would 
run it up his own arm through the antecubital vein up into his own heart and then document it by standing in back of a fluoroscope. It was an unheard of technique at the time and no one wanted him to do it. He actually wound up winning a Nobel Prize for it. How soon until we see mass-produced artificial hearts that can be implanted? I don't think you're ever going to see mass-produced artificial hearts. You're much more likely to do things like build a heart uh, from scratch, either uh, using a 3D printing or using a cadaver heart that you've stripped away all of the cells uh, and then added cells uh, from the recipient so that the heart doesn't have a, re a so the body doesn't have a, re a doesn't reject the, that heart. That's much more likely, and that's that's actually in the works. We'll probably see it within the next decade. The body recognizes it as something biological. Well, no, not only biological, but it recognizes it as you. You know, the first mentions of cardiac, anything that you could consider a cardiac medicine would be about 1550 BC, the Egyptian Book of the Heart. It's just fascinating to think that they, that they even cared about this kind of stuff. Oh, well, they were, they, they were physicians as well. They just didn't have... Uh, Blue Cross. Yeah, they didn't have Blue Cross. <laughs> and, and they, they didn't have the gear that we have now. They had blue shield though, and they, and they would whack you in the head with it if you came too close. Bill Schott, thank you so much. Really nice uh, meeting you, and a pleasure to be on your show. Go to Amazon and do your part. The book is Pump a Natural History of the Heart. And at the heart of what we all have to deal with all the time is climate change. The impact of global warming is not just being felt on land, and it's affecting more than people. Our Andrew Falzone tells us how climate change is impacting fisheries on the East Coast and around the world. In the case of, of commercial stocks, there is an indication that climate is causing the change in a very, very rapid shifts in either distribution or productivity. Dr. John Manderson is a PhD field ecologist on the front lines of not just ocean research, but fishery management, the science of making sure that there are enough fish to harvest from the world's oceans. A pretty important task, considering that the World Wildlife Fund reports that worldwide, three billion people rely on seafood as their primary protein source. And the way to continue to feed people based on fish is to shift away from the losers to the winners, winner stocks. But winner or loser, the ocean is still in flux because of climate change and winners could become losers. So there are a lot of difficulties in, in assessing this, but, but we've known and been able, able to measure the impacts of changes in climate and to attribute it in climate. We've been able to do that well since the, uh, the late 1990s. Tony Delernia is the founder of Rocket Charters, a recreational fishing charter on the east side. Before that, he was the director of the maritime program at CUNY's Kingsborough Community College. He recalled a conversation with a NOAA researcher in the 2000s. I said, you know, it looks like the, the stock has shifted significantly. And he said, well, that's a good research concept. And they did some research and next thing I know, they publish a paper that states that the summer flounder stock, the center of the summer flounder stock, has shifted northeast about 250 miles. In general, we're seeing shifts of animals towards the north and east. And in general, we're seeing animals move to deeper depths where there are cooler temperatures. That's because fish are very particular about the water conditions they need to survive, including temperature and pH. The change that we've been seeing in the ocean have been happening at rates about 10 times faster in the ocean than on land. I've been told by physicians that if the pH of our bloodstream has changed, the amount, the pH of the ocean has changed already, we would be dead. 
ultimately, if you need cold water and productivity, you're going to run out of planet. The changes have affected fisheries on the East Coast so much that Delernia helped get the New York State Attorney General to sue NOAA, the federal agency that manages federal fishing quotas, over New York's flounder quota, which is based on data from the 1980s when flounder lived further south. The species has migrated north because of climate change, but some southern states still have very large quotas for the flounder that no longer live there. They catch the fish off of Long Island, and then they steam all the way to North Carolina to offload them. Talk about a carbon footprint. And according to Dr. Manderson, it's not uncommon for regulation to lag behind reality. If you can speed up the science, then if you can speed up the governance process, you will still be able to have sustainable fish on the table as a food source. The New York AG's lawsuit is still pending in federal court. Meanwhile, scientists and fishermen are holding out hope that regulation can catch up to reality in the oceans. I'm Andrew Falzone for CUNY TV. Food waste is a major problem in the United States that contributes to climate change. Susan Jun explores the issue and the negative impact on our environment. Whether it's overstocked shelves, imperfect produce, expired labels, or trashed leftovers, food waste happens on a massive scale across the U.S. About 40% of food produced is never eaten. The equivalent of feeding 164 million Americans every day. Hard numbers to swallow when 42 million Americans grapple with food insecurity. While the humanitarian impact of food waste is apparent, the environmental impact is just as dire. Many people don't know that agriculture is one of the biggest users of energy, land, um, fresh water, all of that. And while that waste depletes valuable resources, it also directly contributes to greenhouse gas emissions. So in a landfill that is void of any sort of oxygen, food waste sits there and releases these gases into the atmosphere and doesn't turn into anything that's nutrient dense. In fact, according to a UN report, the total carbon pollution from food waste worldwide is about the same as global emissions from vehicles. And along with the environmental impacts, the cost implications are astronomical, having a direct impact on everyone's wallet. The average consumer at home weighs something like 238 pounds of food annually, which is like you or I throwing away $1,200. Efforts to reduce all this waste are fought at every level and stage of the supply chain, starting from the farm where 20% of produce gets thrown away because it isn't visually perfect, although perfectly fine in quality. Activists work to transform food perceptions while innovative businesses sell the ugly produce that would otherwise go to waste. Another promising approach to combat surplus waste is upcycling, which takes use food and turns it into valuable ingredients for other products. Of the 40% of food that's wasted, quite a lot of that, actually about another 40% of that, comes from people in their home. In response, the Natural Resources Defense Council, NRDC, set up the Save the Food program, which helps consumers understand and tackle food waste at home. Date labels are a big contributor of consumer food waste because they're actually not federally mandated. Which means food that's labeled expired often has a longer life. Using your sense of smell and taste is the best way to judge whether food is still edible. Even sour scraps can be salvaged by using creative recipes. And once it's truly trash, don't trash it. Instead, compost it can actually break down into nutrients and then revitalize the soil and then actually in some cases pull down carbon from our atmosphere. At the public level, the NRDC is working with cities to partner with restaurants to create dishes with food that would otherwise go to waste, manage inventory to avoid overstocking, connect with composting partners, and donate to food rescue charities so excess food goes to feed those in need. It really takes 
more cohesive effort. Education is also key. The Hunter College Food Policy Center just launched a food policy course that addresses the wide-ranging impacts of food waste. For more on how you can save food and the environment, visit savethefood.com and nycfoodpolicy.org. For CUNY TV, I'm Susan Jun. And that's our show. Questions, comments, you can always reach us at tv.cuny.edu. And of course, we're on social media. I'm Barry Mitchell. Stay safe. We need the viewers. And we'll see you next time on Simply Science. Ba -ba -da -dum -dum. Down, but that's the dumb, dumb.